Uh, excuse me, Mr. Dungeon Master. I, I sort of have a problem. You see, you keep awarding me inspiration for good role playing, but, but I can never have more than one inspiration. So the, the rules kind of suck. Good role playing? Are you serious? He gives you inspiration to make you feel better because you're such a <laughs> horrible barbarian. You shut up! I wasn't talking to you. So, so what do you say, Mr. Dungeon Master, sir? Do you? Do you think you could house rule a little something something? Absolutely anything for my best role player. Hey, you know what else we could use? Something to get the wizard to make up his dang mind a little bit faster about which spell he's gonna cast. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm getting really tired of our combats being so slow just because our wizard takes forever on his turn. Well, if you had a big book full of spells to choose from, it'd take you longer in combat too. Besides, I don't see you complaining when I cast Fireball. Sure, some house rules to make combat go faster? I could do a little- Well, the stupid part is that you sit there for five minutes looking at your spells, and then you always cast Fireball anyway. Is, is Fireball the only spell you know? Well, here's a spell that's not Fireball. Oh yeah, whatever. You you know I'm gonna make my say- Yes, Gary's back. G Gary, Gary, we've missed you. Welcome to the DM Layer. I'm Luke Hart, and I've been a Dungeon Master since high school. On this channel, I give practical Dungeon Master advice that you can implement at your game table. Today in the Layer, we're gonna be talking about seven simple house rules that can improve your Dungeons and Dragons game. None of these rules are complex or complicated, and you should be able to implement them quite easily into your game. And I do wanna let you know, too, that I came up with this list by asking my own players which house rules of mine they liked the most. Now, real quick before we jump in, I want to give a huge thank you to all of my patrons over on Patreon. You are all amazing, and your generosity allows me to do what I do. And for anyone else who is getting value from my videos and is interested in supporting my content, I'll put a link down below to my Patreon page. Not only would you be an active part in what we're doing around here, but my patrons get exclusive perks such as monthly voice chat hangouts, one-on-one -on -one consultations, and even choosing which videos I make. Some even get minis painted by me. Okay, now for my top seven house rules. Number Number one, luck points. Okay, luck points are something that I came up with because I was a little bit dissatisfied with the inspiration system in Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition. The problem with the inspiration system is, first of all, you can only have one inspiration at a time. I would constantly find my players would not use their inspiration because they would be saving it for an important event, such as a boss fight. So I would be awarding my players inspiration, but they would be like, I've already got inspiration. And so they'd be technically earning it, but never really getting it because they never used it. The next problem with the inspiration system is that you have to declare that you're using inspiration before you roll your d20. This basically causes you to potentially waste it if you would have rolled high anyway. Because by the rules, you don't get to roll the die first, see if it's high or low, and then decide if you want to roll again or not. That's, that's not the way it works. You have to declare that you're using inspiration before you roll, and then you roll with advantage. So my luck point system replaces the inspiration system and fixes both of these problems. And this is how it works. Basically, you earn luck points for the exact same things that you would normally earn inspiration for. So if a player role plays his personality trait or his flaw, he will then gain luck points. I simply take a d6, I roll it, and that is the number of luck points that the player earns. And there is no limit to the amount of luck points that you can have stockpiled. So you can keep on earning them and keep on adding them up and you can stockpile them until you have tons of them. And that's perfectly fine. In fact, many of my players do that. And then you can use your luck points two different ways. First, you can use luck points to increase or decrease your own d20 rolls. I have no idea why you would want to decrease your own d20 rolls, but it is a possibility. To increase or decrease your own d20 roll, you spend luck points on a one-to-one -one basis. So if I roll a four and spend five luck points, then I can make it a nine. Or if I roll a 19 and spend 
five luck points, I could make it a 14. The only caveat to this is that if you increase the total result to a 20, it does not become a critical hit. You cannot create critical hits by using luck points. In the same way, you can't create critical failures by using luck points. The second way that you can use luck points is to influence the d20 roll of other players or the dungeon master. To do that, you spend luck points on a two to one basis. So for instance, if another player rolls a five, I can spend four luck points to increase it to a seven. In other words, it costs me four luck points to make an improvement of two. It works the same way against the dungeon master as well. I have yet to have a player use his luck points to influence my own rolls, but I'm sure that when they finally do use it that way, they're gonna get a big kick out of it. Number two. Tactics discussions between combat rounds. Okay, there is something about Dungeons and Dragons that I do not like, and that is how long combats can take. And in my opinion, the number one thing that contributes to combats taking longer than they should is player discussions about tactics that happen throughout the entire combat before each player's turn. In other words, it's one player's turn and then the entire table is discussing what that player might do and then it takes a while, and then it's another player's turn, and again, the entire table is discussing the most optimal thing for that player to do, and that takes a while, and you rinse and you repeat. And if you do that over the course of an entire combat, it ends up taking forever. So, I do not allow my players to do that. I do not let them discuss tactics before each player's turn. Now, I'm not a jerk about it, but I just, don't allow it. I enforce it as a kind of soft ban. However, I do recognize the need for players to discuss tactics during a combat, so I came up with a solution for that. Basically what I do is in between each combat round, I allow the players to have one minute during which they can discuss tactics that they're going to use during the next round. And so the players will have a discussion. I'm going to cast Fireball, you're going to do that, go over there, sneak attack on that one person, you're going to heal me, blah, 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 whatever. And they get one minute to do that, period. So that when the combat round begins, everybody has a basic idea of what their tactics were going to be for that round. And it makes things go a lot faster. And it prevents tactical discussions that otherwise would happen before each player's turn. You gotta trust me, that one minute discussion between a combat round will save you 10 or 15 minutes if you would otherwise have let your players discuss their actions before each player's turn. Number three, declaring actions in combat quickly or dodging. Okay, this house rule kind of goes along with the purpose of the previous house rule, which is to make combats go faster. The way this basically works is that when I tell a player that it's their turn, they have about five to 10 seconds to tell me what they're doing. If they don't respond with what they're doing, I start to put a little bit of pressure on them. I start to bug them. I start to say, hey, you know, I, I need to know what you're doing here, you know, sometime today. But Luke, you may say, what if your players don't like feeling pressured like that? What if, what if you're increasing their anxiety or something. To which I would respond, it's combat. It should feel a little bit stressful. You should feel a little bit of pressure. Now, I do it in a very good natured sort of way. I'm not trying to be a jerk. I'm not trying to give somebody an anxiety attack or anything. And it's done with the intention of making the combat go faster. And if the player doesn't give me an action quickly enough, I declare that they're dodging for that round and then they don't get to do anything at all. They essentially lose their turn. And let me tell you something, once a player has lost their turn once or twice, they will 100% be faster next time because nobody wants to lose their turn in combat. It, it really, really sucks. Some of you might think that I'm coming across a little harsh with this rule, and, and it might be. However, everyone has been in a game with a wizard or a sorcerer or a druid that cannot decide which spell to cast. And that player sits there for five minutes trying to figure out which spell to cast. And that drags the entire game down. But Luke, you may say, spells are complicated. It's, it's, it's hard to choose which one to cast. To which I say, yes, you're absolutely right. That's why you should be trying to figure out 
what you're going to do on your turn during the other player's turns in the combat. And you should be familiar with your own character and their spells. That way you're prepared for the game session and don't punish everybody else because you can't make a decision. Oh, by the way, I'm actually experimenting right now with a new initiative system that I think helps with players who don't know what they're going to do on their turn. I don't think it's 100% unique to me. I feel like I probably stole elements of it from other people. But once I get to the point that I feel that it actually works well and does what I want it to do, I'm gonna share it in a future video. Number four, secret death saving throw checks. Okay, we've all been there. One of the PCs goes down and is at zero hit points. Let's say it's the Paladin because we all love Paladins. And the player rolls a death check and passes. So the rest of the players are like, no big deal. And then the next round, the Paladin passes the death check again. That's two passes and zero failures. At this point, the other players aren't sweating it at all. They can take their time. There's no worries about healing that Paladin because he's in no danger of dying. Of course, what we have going on in this situation is metagaming. The characters don't know that the Paladin is okay. The players, however, do understand the Paladin is in no danger of dying and thus there's no urgency in healing him. So I came up with a very simple thing that prevents the players from metagaming in this manner. I, the Dungeon Master, roll the death checks when a player's character is at zero hit points. I do it secretly behind my screen, and I tell no one what I rolled. In fact, I will make sounds and faces that throw the players off if they're trying to guess what I might have rolled. This way the players have no idea if the Paladin succeeded or failed on his death check. Not only does this prevent metagaming, but it also adds a sense of drama and urgency when a player goes down to zero hit points. And the other players are now worried that the Paladin might die and they have their characters try to get over there as quickly as they can to heal him. I feel like this small change facilitates role playing so much better than if the death checks were rolled by the players themselves. And it makes this whole situation that much more exciting and dramatic for the players. The only thing I want to mention about this technique is to play it straight. Do not fudge the death checks. Don't use the secret rolling of death checks to bring the characters back to life, nor should you use it to kill them. Rule straight. Play it straight here, Dungeon Masters. Number five, my D12 random encounter system. Okay, I love random encounters, and almost every time my players are taking a short or long rest or traveling somewhere, I have them roll for random encounters. On a short rest, one player rolls a D12 to determine if a random encounter happens or not, and then on a long Long rest, two players will roll a d12 to determine if a random encounter happens or not. And then for each day of travel, one player will roll a d12 to determine if a random encounter happens or not. A random encounter happens not based on what the d12 actually comes out as. Instead, I, the Dungeon Master, also roll a d12 behind my screen. And then, if the number that the player rolled matches the number I rolled, for instance, if we both rolled sixes, then a random encounter happens. And this is the reason that I like this system. It gives me, the Dungeon Master, complete control over whether a random encounter happens or not. You see, there are some times during a game that you absolutely do not want a random encounter to happen. You may have some goals for that game session, some things that you need to get done. You might sense that your players really just want to get onto the next dungeon and start running it. So in those situations, even if a random encounter comes up based on the dice rolls, I ignore it. On the same token, there are times when you want a random encounter to happen. For instance, you might need to delay them from getting to the next dungeon because you haven't had a chance to plan it yet. Or you might have planned out a super cool random encounter for them on the way to the dungeon. In those instances, you simply ignore the dice results and have a random encounter happen anyway. Now, I am not suggesting that you always ignore the dice and do whatever you want. I also like to follow what the dice say and then roll up a random encounter, usually with Cobalt Fight Club or something. All I'm saying is that this system gives you the freedom to ignore the dice when you want to or when you need to. Now you might say, but Luke, you could do the exact same thing by just rolling one d12 yourself behind the screen. And of course you are 100% correct. The reason that I use this system is because it makes my players feel 
like they are involved in whether or not a random encounter actually happens. And sometimes they are, and sometimes they aren't. It's all smoke and mirrors, like most of the things that a dungeon master does. Number six, drinking a healing potion with a bonus action. Okay, I don't think that this is a unique house rule. I'm pretty sure that there are other dungeon masters that do it this way too. The way I do it is that when you drink a healing potion, you can use a bonus action to do so. Drinking any other type of potion costs an action, just like a normal rules say it does, and administering a healing potion to someone else also takes an action. And here's why I do it this way. I like to throw lots of big, nasty creatures at my players, so I want them to have easy access to healing during combat. Allowing them to drink healing potions with a bonus action lets them keep on fighting as they're healing up. If they have to use their action to drink a healing potion, then they lose the ability to fight at the same time. And the way the 5th edition rules are made, if you start using your action to drink healing potions instead of attacking the enemy, you are in big trouble because the enemy can almost assuredly deal more damage per round than you can heal per round by drinking healing potions. It is a death spiral. Allowing my players to drink healing potions with a bonus action fixes this death spiral and allows me to throw a lot of big nasties at them in combat. And I don't have to worry quite so much about their ability to stay in the fight and keep fighting and not go down. Number seven. Settling rules discussions with a dice off. Okay, this happens at every single Dungeons and Dragons game table. There is a question about a rule and then the player and the dungeon master start to have a discussion about it. This discussion can sometimes turn into a debate and it can then turn into looking up rules in the books and it can also turn into seeing if Jeremy Crawford has tweeted about this particular rule question or not. And this sort of thing can bring your entire game to a grinding halt. So I have a very simple rule for this. The player and I have a quick discussion about the rule. Quick being the important part, and I should say that I usually try to involve all of the players to see what everybody thinks about the rule in question. And then at that point, if we have not collectively decided the proper ruling, or if I disagree with what the player thinks the rule should be, we have a dice off. The player rolls a d12, and I roll a d12. Whoever's d12 is higher is the one that gets his way for the game session. And then what I'll do is offline, after the game has ended, I will do more investigation about that rule, and I will figure out what makes the most sense for the game. And then I will let my players know how we're going to run it going forward. But this happens outside of the game, so that it is not stopping our gameplay. Let me know your favorite house rule down in the comments. Next week, we'll be telling you the story of how Gary the Intern ran amok in my very first Adventures League game. But until then, click right here to learn about my house rules for chase scenes. And until next time, let's play D&D.